Good day. My name is Robert McGee, and I'm here today to talk about the secret language of Solaris. So Solaris is a part of Houdini, focused specifically on look dev, layout, and lighting. Now, bringing this new concept into Houdini has brought in a whole new bunch of concepts and ideas that you need to sort of wrap your head around in order to get comfortable with it. Now, whether you're somebody coming to Houdini for the first time from another lighting package, or whether you're a Houdini artist who has been working with the traditional workflow and is moving over to Solaris, uh, this is really designed for you, this presentation, because it's going to help lay the groundwork for your understanding of all these new concepts and ideas. So we know that Houdini is a node-based solution, a procedural node-based solution that has a whole bunch of nodes that do a bunch of different things. Objects handle transforms, surface nodes handle geometry, look dev nodes uh, are actually the Solaris context we're going to be dealing with, Vex does shader building, render outputs, compositing tasks, and dynamics. And all of these have these sort of short forms, which form sort of that secret language I'm talking about. Surface operators are known as SOPs because nodes equal operators. Look dev, lops, specs, bops, rops, cops, etc. Now, if you're in a studio listening to veteran Houdini artists working, they will probably refer to things as SOPs, rops, cops, etc. And it's important for you to be aware of that. It's going to help you integrate your knowledge uh, with with what they're up to. Now these are the four contexts or five contexts we're probably going to be working on the most in this uh, presentation uh, even though the other ones may come into play at some point. So before we go forward let's talk about Houdini and the fact that traditionally uh, you would render out to the Mantra render, a built-in render that worked with Houdini but the goal has been to modernize that and in the process rather than just create another render uh, we took it one step further and created a context for look dev layout lighting that would then feed this new render we called Karma. Now what's special about this new process is that Solaris works with USD. This is an open source solution brought to us by Pixar uh, that's called the Universal Scene Description and essentially everything you bring into Solaris becomes USD then that USD spits out to a technology also by Pixar called Hydra, which allows the USD to be rendered either to the viewport or to a render. Karma either works in the viewport with Hydra or you can render the disk with it. There's also a whole bunch of third party renders that also allow you to connect to Hydra. Now, many of these renders that are listed here also work directly in Houdini, the same way as Mandra, uh, but having them in the Solaris workflow, working with Hydra, is an even better uh, solution uh, for integration. So we're going to start with rendering to Mandra, or the way things were. So we have a bunch of objects, some of them parented. Uh, each of them have a geometry network or a SOP network inside them where you build your geometry. Then you create some materials in the slash mat, which is a BOPS context. You assign materials either to the object or to the geometry level using uh, layers uh, or groups. Uh, you then add your lights and cameras. And then you put down a render operator uh, for Mantra. That render operator will then take everything from your scene and import it in using IFD, which is a scene description format. Now that sounds familiar. USD was the universal scene description. IFD is a scene description specifically for Mantra. Now, that would then allow you to render to disk. Uh, you could also do third-party renders the same way. So as I mentioned, those renders on that list could work this way as well. They wouldn't use IFD. They'd probably use their own format. RenderMan, for instance, used RIB. So let's take a look at rendering to Mantra. So here we have a scene in Houdini. And there we go, tumbling around in a 3D view. And here we have the parameter pane and the network where we have the nodes. Here's the barrel node. 
which has, uh, if we go click here, we have transforms on here. And we could dive down to see the geometry, which is a file node that's importing an OBJ file from disk. So that could be modeled in Houdini and exported out, or maybe from somewhere else. Another application. Now here we have the model being moved around. So at the object level, you're dealing with its transforms. And here we see a hierarchy with this pot. So as I rotate the pot, the book goes with it. Uh, or we can deal with the leaf individually. So you've got some flexibility there uh, in terms of how you set up your scene uh, to allow you to lay things out. Now we also have um, other elements in here, um, such as the lights and the cameras. And here's the backdrop. Now the backdrop is special because if I dive down, you see there's actually a geometry network in here. I've got a, let's zoom out a little bit. I've got a flat grid. Uh, I projected some UVs onto it. I bend it and do a subdivide. And this is the procedural kind of network that you can use to create all sorts of things in Houdini. Uh, and sometimes you keep the network live in your scene like this. Other times you bake it out uh, and then re-import the file. Here's the lights and the camera. Get the handle tool to see the handles for that camera aimed at the scene. Now we go in and we look through it and the handle's still there if we want to manipulate from this point of view. Um, but that's essentially our scene ready to go. Now, once we have this, we then want to assign some materials. So we go to the, the mat, mat context, which is a VEX builder, and we can drag over our backdrop material, uh, or we can use the material palette, which will allow us to maybe do the barrel, the basket, the book, and the pot. Now you'll notice that the barrel and the um, basket, they're not quite right because they need different materials assigned to it, not just one. So we're gonna go back up to the object level and we're gonna find that assignment of that single material and delete that. We're gonna deal with those two separately. So if we go down to this level, you'll see that we can put a material node down And in that material, we're going to take advantage of some groups that are on the geometry. Uh, if you've got a good modeling team, they'll put together nice groups that you can use when you go to assign materials. Um, we've got the basket assigned there, and now we're going to do the carpet and the sheet and assign a different material to that. So with those groups in place, we quickly assign the materials that we need. Then we can go up the object level and do the same with the barrel. So the barrel, the only difference is we've got a material that we're going to assign um, to the sides and then another one for the top. So we're going to do the barrel and the straps, and then we're going to go put the basket material or the barrel material on that. And then if we tumble around, we see we didn't do the top yet. So we're going to do the plus sign and we're going to do the lids. And there's a barrel lid material. So there we go, we have everything uh, set up and assigned, and that will allow us to render out our shot. Now the way, before we can do that though, we need to have what's called a render output or render node. And we're gonna create that here with a mantra PBR. We're gonna take that mantra node and we're just gonna render to a, a render view called mplay, and that'll allow us to see what this scene looks like. So we click that, it's gonna open up a window and you'll see that it's going to start marching through and rendering that. Now, this particular render, um, you know, it takes a little bit of extra time. That's one of the reasons why we started exploring Karma. Uh, and it, as you can see, it takes about two and a half minutes to render this scene if we see it right through to the end. So starting to render with Karma, we're going to just diagram this out and a couple different possibilities for doing that. One is that we take uh, this, this new LOPNET or stage, the Solaris stage, and we put down a single node called a scene import. And using that node, we can suck everything that we had at the object level, at the material level, and bring that in into that single node. That node converts everything to USD so that we can see it in the what's called the scene graph. Universal scene description uh, is seen in the, in the scene graph. Now, that allows us to see things in the viewport through the Hydra Delegate to render with Karma or Houdini GL, or we can put down a Karma node and render out to disk. Now, 
What if you're like, I don't want to look at Solaris at all. I, I wish I could do it the old way, the way you had it with Mantra. Well, it turns out with Houdini 19, you can. You can put down a Karma ROP. And at first you're going to say, wait a second, if I can do that, why even bring up Solaris? What's, why is Solaris even important? Well, you're not really escaping it completely. The reality is that inside your Karma node is a LOPnet. And basically, the objects and materials and so on are being brought in in the same way as we brought them over to Solaris. Uh, you're just bringing them inside because Houdini has this ability to have nodes nested within nodes and built into what we call digital assets. So the Karma node here is a digital asset and you bring in everything and you render it to disk. And you can also see it in the viewport. So from, a, from an artist's point of view, it's going to feel exactly like what they were doing before with Karma or with Mantra rather, um, but with the new faster render. And so let's go take a look at that in action. So here's the same scene. And we're going to start by instead of using the Mantra um, to render, we're going to put down a Karma ROP. Once we have that, let's do exactly what we did before and render to mPlay. What you're going to see is that this is going to come up render a little differently. Uh, the way that Karma renders is it renders to the first pixel much more quickly. So you're going to see a view of your scene very, very quickly. Uh, everything won't be resolved. Some of the noise won't be cleaned up. Some of the secondary uh, kinds of parts of the rendering are still going on. Uh, but within about 15, 20 seconds, you saw the whole thing. You could make a decision to cancel now if you wanted to. Other than that, you can wait and we'll just pause through. This time, instead of two and a half minutes, we're about a minute and a half. So definitely we're getting speed improvements by going with um, Karma over Mantra. And we can also bring up the viewport uh, from the ROP. There's a button to bring up this panel, which gives us our settings here. And then we can go and see the Karma ROP here. So this is looking um, good and you can actually tumble around and you get a sense of what's the scenes like um, as soon as you release the mouse button, it starts to resolve itself. Uh, and that's looking pretty good. Now, there is another option here, uh, which is that there is a new engine added with the DD19 Karma XPU, which is a GPU slash CPU hybrid. Now, this is much faster in terms of its resolving, uh, and you get a great thing there. Now, the XPU engine is in alpha with Houdini 19, uh, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on as you move forward, and we'll use it here and there uh, throughout uh, this presentation. Now, you notice up at the top, there's this path. Now, we put down a Karma ROP, but this path suggests there's a LOPnet somewhere. So if we go back to the output node, we double click on that Karma node, we see, oh, there's a LOPnet inside it, just like we predicted. And inside there, it's not using a single node, it's using a bunch of different nodes, but that's essentially, it's just bringing in that one um, everything and just rendering it. Now, the other option is to go to Solaris. Now, Solaris is empty. Uh, the stage is, is got nothing in it by default, but we can do an import all, which essentially says go get everything from the object level, bring it all in. And it's ready to render. So uh, we're already rendering to Karma in the viewport. Uh, the scene description or the scene graph is all set, ready to go. And uh, we're rendering that. Everything's looking good. Now, we can change that to the XPU engine if we want. And again, that resolves really, really fast in terms of working there. Now, one of the advantages of bringing all this over into Solaris as opposed to doing it with the ROP uh, is that we can tweak and continue to explore our lighting and our scene um, in here as a lighter. So I can bring down something called a light mixer node. And with that, I can take the lights that, that were imported in and continue to tweak them. But what's neat is what I'm doing here is layered on top of what was imported. So if I don't like what I do with the light mixer, at any point I can just delete it, get rid of it, uh, and we're good to go. So as you can see here, I can play around with the intensity of the lights using the uh, sliders that we set up here in the light mixer. Uh, and this allows us to, let's switch the fill light and the key light to get a very different look for this shot. Now, in addition to just the intensities and so on, um, you can also do some other things like, well, what if I want to change the position of the lights? So there's the transform tab. And once you go to the transform tab on there, um, you can start to reposition lights. So let's just get the handle tool. Uh, and we've got 
point light two, and we can let's find the specular. So we can use these viewport tools so we don't have to tumble around and, and figure out where the light's looking from. We can just click and click on different parts of the scene and get reposition the lights using this. So that's pretty exciting tools there. And we'll go into a little more examples of that later when we're talking about lighting. So let's say we've tweaked our lighting. We're happy with the result. This is better than what we got when we first imported it from the scene. Um, we can now go and put a Karma node down. And this one will give us a new set of render settings um, that you can use to render disk and uh, do general output. And we can do the CPU or the uh, XPU version of, of, of Karma in there. Okay, so now that we have looked at basic setup, let's look at a little more detail at how you would work with and import geometry into your scene. So we've already looked at the idea of working at the object level and then using a scene import to bring that in. Another option is to do a SOP create. And in this case, the SOP level, instead of being inside an object, is inside the LOP itself. So you're literally building things right here on the stage. Uh, you can also export to USD and then use a various uh, kinds of nodes to import that back in. And we'll talk about some of those uh, in our demo. Now, this of course brings up a lot of USD ideas, things like layers, variants, sublayers, and so on. We're not going to deal with that here. That's sort of like the secret language of USD. Um, there is a USD primer available on our website if you want to go and get into that world. But one of the important things I'm trying to show here today is that while you're using USD when you're in Solaris, you don't really have to be 100% aware of it to have success. And uh, you can think about this more as a Solaris uh, workflow as opposed to a USD workflow, even though everything you're doing is working with and referencing USD. And there are times that you have to understand it, uh, but it's with Solaris, you can certainly get away with thinking with it, thinking about it more like an artist does. So one way of doing this to get USD out would be to, from the geometry level of your objects, is use a, um, a, US, a USD export node to export USD. And then that would be referenced in, uh, add your materials, and then do your layout. And while you're doing your layout, you could go to the viewport and check it with Karma and Houdini GL, make sure you're doing what you want. Another approach is to say, you know what, let's bring that into another LopNet where we're gonna do some look dev on it. So we're gonna take the object, import it in, bring our materials, combine those, and now we'll export a object that has both its material and its geometry working together. That can be then imported in. Now you go straight to layout without worrying about assigning materials and start working with that. Now another thing that you can do uh, with Houdini is use something called tops or task operators. So let's say you have a folder filled with hundreds of objects and you need to convert them over. Instead of doing it by hand, you can set up a, a top net that would maybe have the component builder in it or some other network which would import the pieces in, assign the materials and spit out the USD. You could then assign that to a farm or a compute cloud where it would go off and do all that very efficiently and quickly and spit the results out. And then you'd be able to use those in your scene. So we're not going to go into too much detail of that, but it's good to be aware that that automation process is available as an option within Houdini. So here we have the scene that we had before minus the backdrop. Uh, we've got the cameras, we've got the lights, everything is there. If we select it, we can see everything in the scene graph here. But what we'd like to do is, you know what, we don't need all of that. We'd like to just focus on geometry right now. So one of the options with scene import is to say, just bring in the geometry objects. And it's not bringing in now. So our camera disappeared, our lights are gone, and we won't worry about those until a later stage of this shot. Now, once we have those, uh, we can work with them as normal. And then over here, we have the backdrop. And now the backdrop has been set up now inside a lop. So the same geometry network we had before is now inside this SOP create. And this will allow us to come back and tweak it later if we need to. For now, we're just going to take these two objects and merge them together. So we grab this and we grab this and we're going to merge those together. Now to do this properly, we're going to have to add a material library that will allow us to 
assign the materials that we're working with. The material library holds the materials. And then we have another node called the assign material, which we assign them. And we do that by bringing the primitives over. So we're going to bring over, well, we want the, not just the props, we want to bring the specific backdrop over. So we're going to drag that from here up to here. So that's where we're going to assign the material. And then we're going to use the material path to actually get that. And now we have things more or less the way we had them before. They're merging together, the materials are assigned. Now the materials for the original objects, of course, came from the object level. And there is an option in here, uh, way down at the bottom, if we wanted to say, Ooh, we don't want those materials and they just disappear, uh, but we do want them. So there they are and they're being put in the right place. Now here we are in another scene. So this is somebody else working in Houdini, creating a model, and they've assigned a material and they want to save that to disk as a USD. So using the USD export uh, SOP. We're now going to reference that into this scene and merge it in with the rest of the scene. So as we bring that in, we'll see here's the reference and uh, we're going to go get the file. So there's the table, we're going to bring that in. And what we can do with this is we can set the primitive path to be slash prop. So that's basically the same as the other pieces that we have. And we're going to call it table. So once we go down to lower down on, on the graph here, you'll see that the table's actually been inserted in the same directory in the scene graph. So once we have that, we might want to move it around. So we can select it and just say, let's move this and position it or start laying it out into the scene. And you'll notice that an edit lop has been added at the bottom, specifically focused on the table to allow us to do that. So when you bring things in, you've got a lot of complete freedom to position them and do what you want. Later, if somebody wants to update the table, we can re-reference it in, uh, update our reference and get the new table if they've updated the table or changed the way it works. And this is where it works really nice in a production environment. So now we're going to go back and get the, the, the table material. We're going to copy it, bring it to our material library and paste it. Now, the chance of me as a layout person having access to that material, um, you know, it's going to be a little tricky. Uh, so that we're going to in a second show a better way. Uh, but this is what would be necessary to assign the material to the table using this workflow. Um, there's the table and uh, then we can get the material. Uh, that we just brought in and pasted in and there it is there and there we go so this is a, a good maybe for an artist this might be a good working uh, way but in production there's probably a slightly better approach uh, which we talked about before so let's go up to this level here and let's go up one level above and let's scroll down and there's a, a lop net we put at the object level with that component builder that we talked about earlier now this component builder uh, is designed to prep your files in a very powerful way. And so you can go and set up your materials, uh, assign them and export things with all the bits and pieces that you need. You can even generate a thumbnail uh, for use in galleries down the, down the road. And when you finish, you just say save to disk and that's all taken care of. So now we can go back to our scene. So the artist somewhere else has created this tent shape and we're going to sublayer that in. This is a different way of referencing. Now we go and we go to the tent and we're going to get the tent there and accept that. Now, just like the other piece, we're gonna to need to position it a little bit better. So we're going to select it. Uh, well, we're currently selecting that object. We're gonna select this object and then we're going to move it around. We're going to rotate it, essentially rotate it around and push it back. Now, as we do this, um, you know, it's looking good from the point of view of the, the table and the prop. But one of the things we notice is that the, uh, there's an intersection going on now between this new tent and the backdrop. And this is where the benefit of us doing the backdrop as a SOP create comes in because we weren't sure how that was going to work out. So we can go into the backdrop and fix that and create a, a slightly different setup for that. So here we're gonna go in and we're going to take the grid, 
make that a little bigger. Then we can take the, the bend and change its position so it's a little further back. And then we have to go to the UV and just make sure that lines up properly. So um, we could initialize it or we can just change the values in here. Uh, we're going to change the scale 1515 and change the translate uh, accordingly. Now we subdivide it, go up, and there we go. Now it's not interfering with our scene. We're in a better shape with the backdrop. So now that we have that, um, we sort of laid things out. We want to now add a few more details into here. So let's zoom in and figure out what we can do there. And then we can go back and, and say, well, just like we created the tent, there's a whole bunch of other props that uh, the art department uh, may have created. They've got the pots, they've got baskets, they've got um, you know the basket of carpets that we had before, uh, different kinds of books. And all these props can be created and with the component builder spit out uh, with thumbnails. And that allows us to now use a new element within Houdini 19 uh, called the uh, asset gallery, the layout asset gallery. And these can be brought in, imported in, and used in your scene uh, using a new tool called the Layout Node. And this Layout Node is quite powerful because it has a whole subset of tools built right into it. So you can click the display on here, and what you have is a bunch of brushes you can work with. Some hints on how to use them, but we're going to hide that for now. Uh, and then you can take things from your gallery and drag them over uh, into the Layout uh, Node and start to work with them. Now, when you build things with this, what you're actually going to do is instance that geometry into the scene for efficiency, uh, and that's going to work quite well in terms of setting up the rest of the shot. And let's bring in the, um, the jar as well. Now, once we have that, um, let's make this a little bit bigger um, so that we can focus on the layout here. And let's go and select one of these elements. Let's say we're going to pick the, uh, the book. And we're using the place tool and we can now move around uh, anywhere in here and you see how it's trying to place it on the table on the side wherever it's sort of pointed at and then we click to place that into the scene similarly we can get this basket we're going to come in we're going to put it up maybe find a place on top of that table oops not the side there right there on the top we can also go with these jars now this time instead of just placing we're going to click and drag and now we're going to scale them and we'd also be orienting them if we moved our cursor around a little bit more we could reorient them so you've got a lot of power in terms of placing those things as you work and maybe one more thing let's get the cooking pot and we'll bring that in and maybe just put that on top of the barrel so there we go to complete the little shot that we have now along the way maybe we put one over here maybe we put one up on the wall Ooh, that's too many we don't want that many so we can go to the delete brush that we have here the first one here and we can actually uh, just get rid of a couple of those elements just quickly click click boom they're gone so for laying out complex scenes and really getting things set up this can be a powerful node that uses those usd files that we have on disk also got a nudge tool. Now all these tools that are in here, um, these tools, uh, we're going to probably have more of them as time goes by. And also you can create custom ones as well. And I think there's an example for how to set up your own brush uh, if you'd like to explore and work with that. And there we go. So now we've got that scene set up using um, the scene import, uh, some reference geometry, some sub-layered geometry, some instance geometry using the layout node, a bunch of different ways of getting the scene to be exactly what we need it to be. So now we're going to talk about materials. Now we already used materials in a few of our examples, but I want to give you a better sense of what your options are in this department. So when we first talked about Mantra, uh, we had Vex materials, created in the slash mat context, which is a VOP context. Then when we went to do Karma, we would put those same VEX materials inside a material library node at the LOP, within a LOP net. Now, as we move away from Mantra and focus a little more on Karma, uh, we of course also have the Karma XPU, which we've talked about. Now, Karma XPU does not actually read VEX shaders directly. What happens is when you create a VEX material, uh, inside the material library, 
uh, it creates a USD preview node. And that USD preview node uh, converts what it can from VEX into something that can be used in Karma XPU. That's why most of the time we've used Karma XPU in here so far, it's, everything's been fine. Now going forward, there's lots of stuff that VEX does that will not convert into there. So we need a new language that will work with Karma XPU. So Material X, which is an open source solution, is being brought in to help flesh out a modern uh, shader building solution for Karma. Now, in addition to doing XPU, that will also work with Karma CPU. So you can learn how to build materials for Karma CPU and they will carry over to XPU. Uh, but in the meantime, your FX shaders will, will work through USD preview if you set them up properly. But let's go take a look at a couple of examples and get a feel for that. So here we have two books. One has a VEX material on it. The second has material X. Uh, now they're feeding into a simple network here. There's a material library. The material library then has an assigned uh, material node. The second book has the material X and the first has the, the VEX. Now, if we bring up the scene um, graph, you can see all the materials in there uh, and they're getting assigned accordingly. Now, if we go to the material library and we dive into it, we can look at the different materials. So here's the first material, which is a principled shader, which is sort of like a bit of an Uber shader that comes with Houdini. Uh, it's based on the Disney principled um, solution. And it allows us to go in and change parameters uh, and update things here. So there's a lot of capabilities built right on the node uh, to create material qualities, things like reflection, roughness, metallic, transparency, etc., subsurface, all built into that node. Uh, you can then add texture maps. So for instance, here we put texture maps on some of the uh, more important aspects of this, including a uh, bump map, a normal map. So you've got all this capability built into a single node, and this is one of the reasons why it exports out to USD Preview so well, is because it's very easy to manage and very easy for us to convert. Now along the side, uh, you have these shader effects. So if you go to here, you can add effects here, which would then wire into the little um, knobs at the side of the material, uh, and you could start to build a more complex material um, that lives outside of the realm of what uh, of what USD preview could handle. Uh, so that's definitely an option. But a lot of what you need is built right into the that, so you should be good to go. Now for the second book, we have a material done with Material X. So this one's a little different in that we had to build a little network. So we have some tiled images that feed into a standard surface and then feed into a collect node. And the collect node is what gets assigned um, to the object. And you can see that there's a uh, Base color is grayed out because it's being fed by a texture map. Here we have specular. That's all free. It's not being fed by anything. Although if we wanted to, um, tile the image, third image we have here, uh, is actually, uh, roughness. And we could say, you know what? We want that to be specular roughness, uh, rather than diffuse roughness. So we can wire that into there and maybe cut that. So, you know, it's just a matter of wiring things to, these things together to ultimately get the look that you want. Now, we are rendering with Karma uh, XBU here. Um, so if we tumble around, you can sort of see the quick resolving of that. So that's good. So everything we've done so here is compatible with both, both of those, um, both CPU and XBU. Now, if we go into here and we go to the Material X, you can see a lot of the nodes that are available for Material X. You can't really mix and match VEX and Material X. Um, there might be the odd case where it works, but for the most part, you want to keep them separately. And if you just type MTL X up at the top, you can get all those nodes. And there's ways of filtering which nodes you see to only see the ones you want. If you go to the Material Palette, currently we have a bunch of uh, VEX materials on here and we could put those in the material library, like for instance, this iron, we could drag that in and then work with that. Uh, so that's another option if you decide to stick with VEX as one of your options. The key is that you understand that there's these two options available, and as time goes by, you're going to need to understand the pros and cons and which one could do the best for you in the best situation. And yeah, so there we go. We've got our VEX material and our material X, and those are the two things you need to really think about when working um, in Solaris with either with Karma. The next thing we want to talk about is lights and cameras. 
So we've already done a bit of this earlier on, but we're going to talk specifically about um, sort of the larger pipeline. So when we finished our diagram before, we'd use the component builder, set out USD, done some layout, which is sort of where we stand right now. Now, as we go to put lights and cameras in, um, we can render out to Karma, we can go to the viewport, do our exploration to get our shot. But often we're not doing a single shot. In a project, a single set might lead to several shots uh, in a sequence. So a sequence might be made out of a bunch of different shots that need to be wired together. So we can start to branch off and work on those different shots using different cameras, maybe even different renders. Um, and all of that's possible uh, in LOPS. And then you can take it one step further where you start to really think about it as a pipeline thing where all these different bits and parts are broken up to different artists. So objects are all built by different artists, then they're processed through the system, uh, somebody does the layout, and then different lighters get involved, different um, cam you know, render uh, wranglers get involved uh, to spit all this out. And you notice in between all these different stages, we got little USD icons because the USD format can be used to transfer and share that information. And we're going to do that uh, in our demo here. So here we have the scene that we were working on, and there's the layout node, and under it I put a USD ROP. So this is going to sort of take everything we've done so far, render it out to USD, still referencing the original files that we have on disk. So that allows um, updates to those to flow through the system if need be. So then we go back to uh, a new scene. So now I'm a lighter, I get this new scene, I bring it in, go to the, the, the scene graph, everything I need is there, all the geometry, everything. Uh, but I don't, I'm not responsible for its creation. I can't mess it up, so to speak. Uh, I can't do anything to it other than turn things on, turn things off, move them around. But I'm layering those changes on top. So it's a non-destructive, everything I do at this point forward is non-destructive to what came before. And this is where the power of USD starts to come in from a pipeline point of view. Uh, and um, even if you're an individual artist, you might want to break your work into different stages and know that you're protected at each stage as you go into the next. So I want to focus on lighting. I've got all my geometry, and now I'm going to light it. So I add a camera in to get my shot, figure out what my shot is, uh, and then I sort of go from there. Now when I put the camera in, I can sort of tumble it around using by locking that to get the exact one that I want. And I can turn that lock icon off if I want to make sure I don't lose the camera. If I was to tumble at this point, I would be kicked out of the camera, but then I could get back to it and, and know that it's okay. So now I'm going to start adding my lights in. I'm going to start with a dome light. Um, we're just going to move that off to the side. We're going to add an HDRI. Uh, this is a garage. Doesn't really make sense because it's a, um, well, doesn't really match the time, but it, it gives a, a nice feeling of the light. Uh, so there's the garage, but anyway, we get a nice lighting in here. It looks good from there. But there's a whole bunch of HDRIs out in the world that you can apply here in its place. Now, once we have that, uh, we can start to play with various aspects of it. We're going to maybe increase the intensity. Now we're going to Karma, rendering to Karma right now. Uh, go one, but maybe lower it down. We don't really want the contribution of the, of the environment to be that strong. We want to let other lights dominate so it's, it's not so intense with this. What we can then do is maybe just uh, go to the shelf, add a spotlight into the scene. Now when this goes in, um, it looks through the spotlight and you can lock that camera down to allow you to tumble around and essentially treat it like a camera. So this is where I want my spotlight to look. Uh, then I can play around with some things like intensity, maybe get a lot stronger with the intensity, uh, play around with the shape, maybe focus that a little bit more, go down to maybe five or maybe, maybe 10, 10 might be better. Uh, oh, 15. Okay, we're going to 15 and soften it with uh, maybe 5. So this, when I go back to my camera, you'll see the effect of that on the scene. So that's a nice way. And at any point, you can go back and look through uh, a light and lock it down and move around. Uh, so that's an option there. Go to Karma 
and we get a sense of that rendering. Contribution isn't as strong as I thought. Let's go back to uh, the base properties and maybe really bump that up to maybe 300, maybe 500 and get a much stronger sense of what the contribution is. There we go. And we keep going with the lighting. Uh, maybe we'll call this the key light because uh, where our strongest uh, sort of light is coming off from the side here. Now we're going to add a bit of a fill light in. I'll call this fill light. So you can add as many lights as you need, move them around, set them up, uh, and it can all be done here in this in this thing. If you don't like a light, delete it out, just get rid of it, add a new one in, continue to work from there. So it's got a lot of flexibility uh, in terms of feeding your pipeline here. Now we can move this fill light around by hand if we want, or we can use the viewport tools that we've been talking about uh, to get sort of more exactly what we want. So using the placement mode up at the top, we can say, you know what, I want to use diffuse and I want to fill this area with diffuse light uh, or maybe a little bit down here. Now the light's a little too close, so I'm going to use control to and drag to, to move the distance out. And of course, then um, we need more intensity to support that. So let's go with 100. And now we fill, the fill light is filling that in quite nicely. And we can go later and tweak uh, whether that's exactly what we want or not. Uh, we can continue to try different angles here to see if we get the one that we want. And there we go. So now we've got our fill light, our key light, and shot number one is in good shape. So just to organize ourselves a little bit, uh, what we can also do is I'm just going to put a null uh, down uh, so that I can label this particular aspect of, um, of, of my scene, my sequence. We're going to call that shot one. And then maybe add a karma node for output so I can figure out whether this is a single image or a sequence uh, I can render out using this node here. Now, I'm going to rearrange the order of some of this uh, because we want to create a second shot. So we need to make create a second camera. So we're going to take the camera out altogether. Uh, it didn't quite wiggle out. Let's press Y, cut across there, reconnect this. This shows you very much the non-destructive nature of working with this. I can move this around. Everything works out the same. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these three, the camera, the shot, uh, null, and the karma node, and alt drag them across to create a second shot. So this is one of the great things about uh, this is creating these other sequences works very well in Solaris. And this is the kind of thing that would be very hard to do at the object level. There were some tools to try to do that at the object level, but they weren't as powerful and easy to sort of manage as what's going on in Solaris. So we're going to look through camera two, which by default looks exactly like camera one. Uh, let's go to Houdini G GL, and this will allow us to select this and um, just zoom in and say okay, uh, the second shot's going to focus a little more on this area. Maybe pull out a little bit enough that we can see some of the other elements, like the book a little bit at the bottom and the pot. And there we go. We've got our second shot. Now, sometimes you set up a shot and you go, well, what looked good in shot A doesn't particularly look great in shot B. So what we can do here is we can put an edit node down and say, let's tweak some of the geometry and objects uh, so that we can get the perfect shot here. Not the same as the shot we had before, but you know, as camera cuts happen within a within within a movie or whatever, you know, you're not going to notice these subtle little changes. So we're going to select this here, and we're going to tumble that around and say that would look better in this shot if we had it angled like this. And we're going to move the book forward a little bit. Um, maybe we're going to grab this pot, which still has the hierarchy from the object level, so the two things are working together. That's sort of fun. Um, and then we can also take this table and just say, you know what, we're going to move that, move that back and then rotate that a little bit. And that works better for this shot. Now, again, remember, we imported this scene in. Um, we can't touch 
the original scene. We're not touching the original scene. We're layering on edits and we can bypass them or turn them on or throw them out altogether. The director comes and says, what did you do to my shot? Get rid of that. I wanted it the way it was. Just delete that note and move on. Or, or he can help you tweak it to where you, you knew. So the art directability of the shot, you know, is very well supported by the procedural nature of all this. Now we can then add in a light mixer node. We've used one of these before to say, okay, well, the lights that we've already set for shot one, we don't want them to be exactly the same in shot two. So we're going to make some changes. We'll probably make them a little more drastic than they need to be uh, for illustration purposes. Uh, but we can take these three lights um, and drag them over to add sliders. Now, once we have those, we will start playing with the uh, intensities and the exposure on those. So you've got all that ability. We can also go in and just do it directly with attributes. So very specific attributes. If we wanted to lower the intensity on the dome light, we can also play around with the fill light and maybe lower that down. It's our lower that down so it's much darker. And the key light, oh, we brought the key light down way more than we wanted because the slider only goes up to 10. We can adjust that, but for now it only goes to 10 and we need that to be a lot higher. So uh, let's go to the key light and make that at least 100. And that gives us a little more of what we're looking for. And the fill light maybe go 20. We can also add color to each of these. So let's make it sort of an orangey color. We do that with the key light and the fill light and uh, maybe put the background the same. Maybe make the fill light a little more yellow. That shows up a little more in the highlights. And there we go. We've got a completely different shot using that. And we can, again, just like we did before, if we decide to, um, you know, we want to take the fill light and just change where it's angled. We can change that using the transformation of there. And again, this is transformations that are layered on top of the original setup of the lights as opposed to uh, changing the lights that we had before. So, and if we don't like it, we just delete the whole node and start fresh, um, you know, or we can get what we want. We're not really getting what we want with this specular. Um, maybe we'd be better off to use one of the other options. Um, I'm thinking maybe the shadow. So we go from here. Shift key there. There we go. That gives us a little more of what we want out of the key light. So we can bypass that, go back to what we originally had, or bring it back and say, there's our new lighting for that shot. But if we really want to be able to evaluate them, another way to do it uh, is using a new feature uh, or a feature that we've had um, since the last release uh, for sort of soloing things out. We can solo out the different lights to say, what is their contribution? The fill light is doing this contribution. Uh, the key light, that's the contribution of the key light uh, and so on and so forth. So you can really see what those are and do tweaks individually uh, based on that. You can also get rid of that. And now we can bring up um, the render gallery or the snapshot. So we can take this and do a snapshot of it. Actually, I think we're in Houdini GL. So what we might want to do is, is switch that over to Karma. Uh, and then we'll do a snapshot of that once it starts to resolve a little bit. So we do a snapshot of that. And then let's go over to here and bypass that node uh, and do another snapshot. Just let it resolve a little bit and say, let's do a snapshot of that. Now, once we have that, what we want to do is uh, we can go to another window, bring this up, and it's um, called the Render Gallery. So this allows us to look at our snapshots uh, just as images, not as 3D views. So we can take this and set it as A, take this and set it as B, and now we get a slider that actually allows us to compare these two shots. Now, the changes here are very drastic, so, you know, it's... But if you had more subtle changes, you could really evaluate what is what is better, the option A or option B. Um, in here, if we look at this and we say, okay, which one do we want? Uh, if we go back to the scene, we see that we've already switched back to the original one. But if we go back to this shot and say, no, that's the one we want. If we right click on there, 
we can revert network and it will go to that snapshot and literally change the display flag on the node, change any parameters, it'll even add or subtract nodes if necessary to get you back to where you were when you took that snapshot. So very powerful sort of history of what you're doing as you're lighting through a shot to get what you want. So here we have the scene graph of that particular um, scene all ready to go. And there's the Karma node for rendering the disk. And there we go. So we've got two shots, uh, back to shot one. If we want to go back and look at that, go check the camera out and all of that with a completely different scene graph uh, going to a different Karma node. So very powerful stuff. And uh, this is the kind of workflow that Solaris gives you that the traditional workflow, the, the Houdini to Mantra workflow, uh, wasn't making available. So definitely worth considering Solaris as uh, your lighting and layout tool going forward in Houdini. Now, one thing I want to talk about a bit before we finish up here is the USD scene graph. We've used it uh, and seen it a number of times. Uh, here's the scene graph, and here's a network that creates that scene graph. Now, you'll notice that they are not equivalents per se. Uh, there's a flow of data going on in the network, uh, but the scene graph is like flattening that based on a very particular parameter, which is the primitive path. So each of the nodes in the network define a primitive path, and, and the graph flattens that and puts everything in its proper place. So even if you have different, you know, different nodes, you know, we have a sphere node and a cube node that both get placed in the shape section because of the primitive path. And that's important to note. So the primitive path defines where things go, uh, and you can see that primitive path on the, um, the network underneath the name of the object. Now, what's interesting about this is if I have another network, this network here, this network creates exactly the same scene graph as the first network does. Because again, all that's doing is it's assigning its location in the scene graph. Now, some nodes have to be in a certain order. Like for instance, sign material needs to have the materials and the objects above it in order to do its job. So those have to, to maintain a certain amount of, of order. But you can go even a little further with this. And here we have um, exactly the same result in the scene graph uh, by sort of merging, having a couple of merge nodes and different paths feeding into each other. Now, this is important concept to understand because a lot of Houdini users are used to the use of the flow graph defining everything. Uh, whereas in LOPS, you've got the scene graph is the result of what you do. And the network is more a flow of data to help you make creative decisions, set up different shots, and generally just organize your thought process as you're working. So if you're coming from regular Houdini, this is important to understand about working with the scene graph. And if you're new to Houdini, it just gives you a sense of what the relationship is between the scene graph and the nodes that you find in LOPS. So now that you've got a basic understanding of these things, I'm sure you want to learn more. So there's a whole bunch of options. SideFX has on our website, sidefx.com, we have a under the learn menu, learning paths, we have a lighting and rendering section. That's where you'll find most of the Solaris and Karma type uh, lessons. And there'll be more of them added as we go forward with Houdini 19. Available now, uh, you can get a Houdini foundations lesson that is model, render, and animate. Um, so it's how to get started. It's in the getting started learning path. And that includes some Solaris and some Karma. Uh, you can also go to, uh, in the intro to USD concepts, if you want to get that sort of secret language of USD type content. Uh, again, not necessary to get up and running, um, but as you want to start conceiving of, of pipeline solutions, definitely will become important down the road. Third-party rendering in Solaris, how to integrate other renders like Arnold, RenderMan, uh, Redshift uh, into your workflow, um, Veramix, a way for mix training uh, developed that. He also developed a lighting in Solaris that goes a little deeper into multi-shot uh, situations, doing camera cuts, insertion points, and generally uh, getting a good workflow out of that. Proud to announce that coming soon, we have a new lesson by Moeen Syed called Rendering with Karma. 
this lesson will take you through a whole bunch of different concepts and ideas about working with Karma and Solaris, uh, including a bit of a transition guide, um, learn about the Karma ROP, how to set up your Solaris scene, uh, render materials, render settings, motion blur, AOVs. So it basically goes from a beginner um, sort of introduction to more intermediate and advanced as you go deeper into the lesson. So definitely looking forward to that. And you can see that either the end of this month or the beginning, um, middle of next month, somewhere, somewhere in there. Well, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. You've learned something to, to get you started on the Solaris, uh, the path of working with Solaris. Uh, in this workshop that we have today, there's a um, few other presentations worth taking note of. Um, Solaris on Easy Mode is a production exploration of uh, artists working with Solaris. Understanding Solaris materials gets a little more look at ways of assigning materials, ways of assigning materials efficiently, uh, Material X and other things in that nature. And creating USD assets with Component Builder. We already talked about the Component Builder, uh, but Chris Reidels will take you much deeper into all the different options, especially how it ties in with USD and creating things like proxy geometry and, and variants. So definitely worth taking a look at if you want to prep your models as professionally as possible. And finally, a Solaris production re retrospective, uh, where again, you're going to see the use of, of Solaris uh, in production uh, in a way that helps you understand how you might approach it in your work. Well, again, thank you very much and have a great day.